hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Data Europa Academy webinar. So this is the third webinar of a series of webinars organized for data providers. In our last webinar, we had the opportunity to have technical experts from Frank Hofer, who explained to us what uh, technical openness means on data. And today we're going to move to the other angle, the other side of the coin, that is legal openness. So we organize this webinar called Understanding op Open Data, Legal Openness. So um, data holders need to take very important decisions regarding the legal openness of the, their data when they're making it available to the public. In order to unleash the full potential of data, uh, it has to be open also from a legal perspective, allowing citizens to access this data, reuse it and distribute it accordingly. So we can see already some that some international organizations and governments are, fo are following these trends using open data licenses and improving data reuse uh, also to other citizens and institutions. So in this webinar, we will explain what this means in practice, and we will present the scope from a national and supranational perspective, more precisely uh, the European Commission. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so today we're counting with uh, two different different uh, legal experts to explain these two angles. So first, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Ima Farfan Velasco, and I work for the Publications Office and uh, managing data.europa.eu, that is the official portal for European data. And from the side of the presentation, we're going to have Hans uh, Gros. He's lawyer and founding partner at Timelex, uh, a Brussels-based uh, law firm. Over the past two decades, he has been advising different public administrations and private companies in digitalization, modernization, and data policies with a very particular focus on open data, intellectual property rights, data protection, and information security. And we're going to count with uh, one of our experts from the Commission, so uh, Jean-Paul Etrey, he is a legal officer. He works for the European Commission uh, Central Intellectual Property Service. Uh, he advises the European Commission and new services in intellectual property uh, related matters concerning their activities and projects. Uh, but before joining the Commission, he has been working also um, in private practice as an IT intellectual property lawyer, and also he has been lecturer at the University of Namur in Belgium. So um, they're going to be accompanying us today through the whole journey. Next slide, please. So some rules of the game before we start. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we're going to publish everything on the Data Europa Academy webinar. Please ensure that you mute yourself during the webinar and reserve uh, three minutes after the webinar to help us improve our services by filling out, filling out our, our feedback form. The feedback form is not only to speak about this uh, specific webinar, but also to help us to create additional learning material in the future for you. And for questions, we're going to address them at the end of the overall presentation. We're going to have a specific moment of Q&A. So please don't hesitate to uh, write your questions on the Teams uh, chat. So regarding the agenda, so uh, this hour and a half is going to be divided by a general introduction to legal openness and introduction to uh, the approach of member states that Hans is going to cover. And then we're going to move towards the EU uh, public administration approach that is going to be presented by Jean-Paul, followed by a Q&A and a feedback in which we really recommend you to stay because some the discussion will be very interesting. We want to hear also from you. Um, having said this, I, I'm passing the floor to our expert Hans. So Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let me get my slides up. There we go. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, indeed, I've, uh, I have the, the honor and the pleasure of uh, providing in, uh, the introductory session, the opening session on um, legal openness and uh, how to build um, open data sharing systems uh, from a legal perspective, looking a little bit at what some of the problems are, what some of the challenges are, what some of the um, available tools are, especially also how they're being used and being deployed at the member state uh, level, uh, looking at some, some current trends and some, uh, some current practices. Um, quick introduction from my side. So indeed, I'm a lawyer with a, a law firm called uh, Timelex, uh, works on, on ICT legislation, ICT policy issues. We provide a lot of uh, legal support to the European Commission, to national governments, but to private organizations as well on a variety of topics, uh, including obviously um, intellectual property rights, data sharing, um, data protection, 
um, uh, liability on online services, modernization, and then so forth. Last couple of years, we've also worked on uh, the European Open Data Portal and on uh, also on the upcoming data legislation, all, um, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, and on all of all of those new initiatives, which I'm sure many of you are 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 trying but struggling to follow exactly how they uh, how they work and how the the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Um, basically, this session is all about showing you a couple of those pieces of the puzzle and and how at least they. Uh, are very uh, coherent and consistent in encouraging openness, uh, encouraging open data sharing, and explaining also a little bit on, on what some of the main uh, solutions are for making that happen. Before I sort of um, dive into the more legal aspects, I just want to take it, always like to take a quick step back and look at the, the sort of the, the philosophical angle and what people actually mean about openness, uh, because that is one of the, the challenges. It's, the, the open data, open anything community tends to be very ideologically driven, very uh, passionate, very engaged, very committed, but everybody sort of applies their own ideas on what openness actually is, um, which is natural because this is something that um, started a very long time ago, and you see openness in a bunch of policy areas. The only common thread really is that openness is, is increasingly everywhere. Um, I think, uh, Policymakers and, and legislators and markets increasingly are convinced that openness is a good thing and that we need more of it. But people tend to understand different things behind us. So where does it all come from? What what does openness mean? And um, first of all, I think it's it's worth pointing out. Obviously, we're the session today. We're not really talking about anything new. O openness has been with us for a very long time. I think in the digital environment, it's fair to say that uh, it, it really took off um, probably in the course of the 90s, but the, the histories of, of open policies, open data, open digitization, go back, back along further. Um, this session here today will be mainly about um, open data, data sharing, uh, where we have the whole background of, of uh, obviously of public sector information, PSI directives and open data directives and, and on all of that, but there's a much broader trend behind that. And, and I've mentioned just a couple of examples where you also hear about openness, not just in the context of, of open data and making your own data, your own information available for use to other people, but also just um, in a broader societal perspective. I think open source software is, is one of the um, one of the most intuitive examples of openness as a philosophy. I like starting with open software as an example, because that's the, the whole idea of being software development where you make the source code available to third parties so that they can tinker with your code, that they can make their own versions of it and improve it and you can learn from each other. To me, that's a fascinating example because open source software is something that honestly was really reinvented. When, when software development took off um, in, in the 50s and in the 60s, um, openness was the standard. Openness was what pretty much everybody did. The whole concept that um, code was proprietary and that intellectual property rights should be applied as well. That came later, but the initial onset within academic circles and within scientific circles and also within and the hobby communities was, you know, software is best served, is best shared. It's software needs to be open so that people can build from, from it, learn from each other, improve it and tinker with it. <laughs> so open source as a, as a uh, open source software specifically has a very long, very long history, more than 70 years already. That's something that really had to be as a movement and, and as a legal framework sort of re-institutionalized mainly in the course of the 90s when commercialization of software um, really, uh, really took off. Um, and uh, sorry, if you can ask people to mute when you're uh, not speaking. Thank you very much. Um, so that's that's sort of a very uh, typical example of it. But we also see the, the openness philosophy elsewhere, um, open government, the, the fact that governments should be transparent and that people have the right to ask the government to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. Freedom of information legislation, and intriguingly something that's that's almost entirely still at the national level, not, not standardized at the European level, um, allows you to ask your government, if your member state has legislation, to ask you to ask your government to provide information on why it made certain decisions related to you. The, separate from data protection legislation, open government is a, is a big trend as well. Open access as well in scientific communities, um, there's increasingly uh, pressure to um, publish uh, information, publish articles in open access journals so that the research, which is often publicly funded, can also be made available um, to your peers for reviews so that you can learn from each other more easily. Open science is a standard component now of, of 
uh, European research where you have data management plans. The data that you generate and that you collect in the course of scientific research has to be made openly available so people can duplicate and repeat your research. And then obviously there's the, uh, the, the increasing support for uh, open standards as well open standards in, um, for, for formatting data, for exchanging data, for protocols, et cetera, as a way of making sure that you can avoid lock-ins, that data can be ported from one service provider to the next, from one data holder to the next. We, we know that, that uh, for instance, in competition legislation, the, the, the FRANT standards, the, the, the fact that standards have to be available under uh, and, and fair and, and reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, not necessarily for free, but at least under uh, under open terms, is something that's not just a societal thing, not just a philosophical thing, but also something that is being increasingly legally supported and mandated because it does facilitate uh, openness. And there's really two ways to look at at uh, the whole concept of openness philosophically. You could look at it as a, a, a negative perspective, which is about excluding constraints, which is about saying you cannot stop me from doing what I want. That's a negative perspective. You could also look at it the more positive perspective, and that's sort of the, the philosophy that's that's stressed more commonly in the, the, the open data community and the open data movement, which is that you should get the freedom to access data, to be able to reuse it in any way that you like, including to disseminate it, make your own copies, change it, expand it, improve upon it, and to exploit it, including commercially. Open data is not about um, not making money, not about monetizing it. It's not anti-commercial. It's about creating possibilities and creating um, innovation opportunities. And that's sort of the, the fundamental conviction behind it is that society as a whole benefits from openness. So what does that actually mean from a legal perspective? And from here on in, I do apologize for people who find that less interesting, but the rest of the presentation is about the legal uh, angle and, and not about the philosophical angle. Um, how do you translate that philosophy of openness uh, to uh, a legal context? And um, from a legal perspective, creating a legal environment that supports openness basically means that you have, have either legislation in place and policies in place that uh, mandate or encourage the kind of openness that you need, and or that you have contractual and semi-contractual documents to make that possible. And we see a ton of legal and policy frameworks um, being imposed at the European level, at the national level, at regional, local level, that uh, support encourages, that encourage openness, sometimes also that just mandate openness, where you do not have a choice anymore and you have to share your data. Uh, I mentioned already, the context of open science and open access as, as funding requirements. Um, if you participate, for example, in, in uh, EU funded research, the baseline is that articles have to be published in open access journals and you need to have a data management plan. That's mandatory. If you don't want that, you don't get funded. Um, public procurements, um, you can uh, you can have requirements to use open source data, uh, open source software, or more commonly because it's, it's more realistic in many cases in practice. Um, to apply open standards so that governments and public administrations are not locked in, not acceptable to you, then you don't qualify to participate in a specific public procurement. Um, public sector information, open data directives, the whole requirement that governments as a baseline should make their data available at marginal costs, which for digital data basically means you have to make your data available uh, for free as a general principle. There are many exceptions, but as a general principle, you have to make your data available um, to uh, aspiring reuse, and where there's also increasingly more operational intervention. We've had a couple of iterations, a couple of generations already of public sector information legislation and, and uh, culminating now in the Open Data Directive, and they're increasingly more interventionist in the, the amount of data that gets covered, uh, the constraints imposed on charging mechanisms, the uh, introduction of legal frameworks for high value data sets, which have to be available through APIs to further increase and facilitate openness so that you get dynamic up-to-date data access. Um, all of those are examples of legal frameworks that either gently push or actively force you in the direction um, of openness. I mentioned data portability legislation as well. Data portability is not about giving everybody access to data, but it is about getting you the right to claim your data back. It's a different perspective on openness. It's not so much about making it available for free to everybody, but at least making sure that your data remains your own data. Um, and there's other uh, frameworks that I can mention. I'll get back to some of them later on, uh, on from the, the new data legislation, the Data Act, Data Governance Act. They also try to provide pieces of those puzzles, of the puzzle to make 
um, openness easier and help you overcome some of the legal constraints that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but it's also about implementing separate from legislation to look at contractual and semi-contractual documents that remove barriers to openness and that make it easier for data holders uh, for data producers to grant permissions the positive perspective to say i will absolutely step up and grant you permission to uh to reuse my data i'll talk in the national example section at the the end of this presentation i'll talk about how member states are handling this but we can also already indicate you know, that the use of creative commons licenses um that's that's something that's increasingly common and increasingly seen for member states in relation to their own uh governmental public sector information why? Because basically Creative Commons licenses are internationally known standardized licenses that you can easily use to make data available with limited um, constraints. So that's an easy way for member states to take sort of a low effort and very high impact approach to opening up um, uh, their data. Other member states try to make it even simpler and say, well, we're not using licensing, we're just dedicating uh, we're using uh, specific declarations. Creative Commons has a CC0 declaration. There are other examples. Member states simply come out and say, this my data is not subject to intellectual property rights, or at least I commit to not enforcing any intellectual property rights, which in practice for a data reuser is largely the same thing. To say, Here, here's the data. You do not get a license. You just get an assurance from my side that I'm give, giving you permission to do what you want, and any rights that I may have, I will not enforce it's basically putting data on the public domain, making it freely open to everyone. So those are kind of the, the two big roads that you need to walk on if you want to create an, a legal environment that's conducive uh, to open data sharing. Obviously, you know, as was mentioned in the introduction already, and the colleagues of Fraunhofer did an introduction to that, the legal environment doesn't need, doesn't fix everything. You also need to implement the necessary uh, operational and technical measures, create an environment, a technical environment that's conducive to open data sharing. Um, all the legal paperwork in the world will not help you if you cannot actually put your data out there in a usable format, meaning ideally open standards or at least commonly known standards, um, open interfaces, protocols that people can easily integrate with so that um, in today's open data economy, which is increasingly built on, 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 on the concept of having dynamic services, that data actually can flow freely. It's not just about establishing rights, it's also about just making it work from a practical perspective. Now, and, and the best the rest of this presentation, I just want to look at sort of what makes open data sharing difficult from a legal perspective. So uh, what are the, the barriers? And then looking also at some practical tools to, to, to make um, open data licensing possible. Um, obviously, when we're talking about um, a, a barrier, we're also about an enabler. So the, the big one is intellectual property rights, ancillary rights, related rights, um, and, and their impact on uh, on data sharing and on open data policies. I always explicitly choose, and I think that's also the intellectually fair way to do it, to, to phrase intellectual property rights, not just as a blocking point, uh, not as something that makes life difficult, but also as an enabler. Um, that's not always done in, um, in, in the open data community. Because there, you know, the, the philosophy does tend to be, you know, we should be able to do what we want and intellectual property rights, like copyrights, but also other intellectual property rights, stop us from doing that. So intellectual property rights are the barrier that we need to overcome. Um, but I think it's possible to take a more balanced view there, at least within the European markets, because we do have the benefit of a quite extensive um, harmonization framework. We do have a series of copyright uh, directives, the most recent one, uh, the, the uh, digital single market uh, copyright directive, um, enforcement directives that harmonize how intellectual property rights um, work across the European Union. Why is that a good thing from an EU perspective? Because at least you're going to be facing the same basic rules and the same fundamental problems and the same fundamental solutions as well across all of the member states. Uh, in the absence of those kinds of rules, the situation you know, might be different from member state to member state. It would be impossible to predict what rights even exist to begin with and how they compare to your own uh, intellectual property rights. So the fact that we do have a harmonized framework for that um, at least can be considered uh, an enabler as well. Uh, still, there's also no way to, to, to dance around the problem that intellectual property rights can be a blocking point as well, simply because uh, from a policy perspective internationally and, and at the European level as well, um, intellectual property rights are largely granted automatically, meaning that you have to deal with copyrights, with database rights, um, and even with trade secrets occasionally, um, automatically, even in cases where nobody asked for it, and there where there is no real 
um, economic or societal justification for there was there was no need for intellectual property rights. And that last part is particularly important in a public sector context where a lot of data is produced not um, out of a sense of creativity or out of a desire to create economic value that can be exploited um, by a creative worker, but simply from the fact that governments need to do their government tasks and that as a result of that they collect or generate and maintain um, uh, data sets. Those data sets would have been created as well if there had been no intellectual property rights grant. So this is one of the reasons why, from an academic perspective, it's often argued, you know, there it actually doesn't make much sense for intellectual property rights to apply, but they still do. There is no exclusion uh, in intellectual property law for saying, you know, you, you it only exists when it makes sense uh, from an economics or societal perspective. It's granted automatically. So it does create barriers in some cases. Um, where you have uh, specific sets of data that fall under copyrights, database rights or trade secret rights, uh, even though there is no um, uh, societal need corresponding from it. Um, I, I won't go into detail on, on what they exactly entail, but very briefly and, and vulgarizing it quite a lot, you know, copyrights will exist in any case where uh, a, a creative work, including digital data is created um, and uh, reflects the originality, uh, the, the creative spark of, of, a, of a specific author, meaning in practice, you know, it is an original, uh, an original work, an original creation. It's granted automatically. As a result of it, you get economic rights. So you get to decide whether uh, you will allow or disallow duplication, reuse, or exploitation. That can be transferred, uh, that can be easily uh, managed in practice. Um, and in European context, we also know in most jurisdictions the concept of moral rights, which is the right to uh, make sure that your copyright protected works um, are not used uh, in an unethical way and that you um, have the right to protect your dignity as an author and to be recognized as an author, including the, the, the right to have your name mentioned uh, with your own uh, works. We also have a broad range of, of neighboring rights, um, including publisher rights most recently, which are the rights granted to uh, publishers of new message, news messages. Um, database rights are cases where um, uh, databases, sets of data, collections of data uh, can be protected not only under copyright, but also and additionally as a database right, if you can show that the creation of data required a significant investment. So that's useful in cases, and that's very often the case in a public sector context, where actually um, a specific set of data didn't really require much originality or creativity, where you don't really uh, recognize the, the, the creative spark, the creative genius, so to speak, of an individual uh, creator, um, but where there was simply a significant economic investment involved. And as a result of that, uh, within the EU, we have the concept of database rights, which largely um, in practical terms have the same consequences. If you own database rights, you get to control who is allowed to access and to reuse and exploit um, the data in that database. We also have a regime for trade secret protection, uh, which is less relevant and, and less impactful in this context, which allows uh, in practice mainly commercial organizations uh, to protect information which is um, economically sensitive, economically valuable, and for which they've taken reasonable measures to make sure that the rest of the world doesn't learn about them. That's useful sort of as a complement to copyrights uh, and database uh, rights. So we have a broad range of intellectual property rights where the baseline always is you need to determine whether these apply. Quite often it's in a gray area where the answer is probably yes, this falls under copyright or database rights occasionally under trade secrets, but much less frequently. And if they do apply, that means you need to have a rights management mechanism in place. You need to have a rights granting mechanism in place if you want to share them freely and practice mainly uh, licensing. And I'll get back to what member states are doing from a practical perspective in a moment. The other um, sort of big uh, challenge uh, also from that perspective, enabler at the, the European level, also again, it's, it's, it's harmonized as fundamental rights and particularly data protection rights. I think probably everybody in, in this session knows that the European Union has extensive protection for fundamental rights in general and for data protection uh, in particular through the General Data Protection Reg Regulation, the GDPR. It mainly matters because fundamental rights uh, are also automatically granted like intellectual property rights, but un unlike intellectual property rights, they cannot be transferred or sold or waived. You cannot simply agree not to apply uh, data protection rights. People can't sell their data protection rights. Um, they cannot contractually agree that they will not uh, enforce uh, their, their data protection rights. 
Um, and that makes it difficult to share data openly when it contains personal data. Personal data in the European Union is a concept with a very broad reach. It's not just directly identifiable data, you know, information that mentions your name or your contact information or your email address, you know, stuff that everybody would recognize as being personal data, but also indirectly identifiable data, including things like descriptions of the property that you own, license plate um, of uh, your vehicle, um, your uh, career track records, your, your uh, information that, that indirectly describes you, which even if, if a recipient couldn't directly to say, uh, could, couldn't directly say, oh, this license plate clearly belongs to this person who lives at that address, would still allow them uh, to track you and to evaluate your behavior and could conceptually still could be linked to you. Um, so we have a very broad concept of um, personal data, uh, and this can be challenging. When data that you want to share openly contains personal data, there are a lot of principles in European data protection law that reasonably and legitimately make that difficult. Um, if you're sharing data that contains personal data, if you're sharing personal data with a third party, um, you need to find uh, a way to set that up in compliance with the GDPR. That means you need to organize, you know, how does that transfer work? Is that a transfer from one um, independent data controller to a new data controller? And if so, then you need to have a, 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 a contract in place that regulates the legality of the data use. You need to regulate what they are allowed to use, impose purpose limitations. You need to make sure that the reuse is also transparent to the individual citizens. You need to be able to know that their data is being shared and what it will be used for. Appropriate security measures need to be taken so you can never just toss personal data out there and say, do what you want. There needs to be an accountability mechanism behind there, so you cannot just share data and say, it's not my problem what somebody else does with it. That's not my responsibility. I wash my hands off of that. And you need to manage international transfers as well. The fundamental principle uh, of European data protection law is if you're holding personal data, you, can't, you cannot just send it to a jurisdiction outside of the European Union where equivalent protections might not apply. You cannot send personal data to a country that has no data protection legislation and hope for the best. All of that means, in a nutshell, that you can never get into a situation where personal data is literally made available without constraints. And a sort of a do what you want philosophy, that does not work. You need to apply certain downstream controls, i.e. you need to impose as a data holder legal constraints on whoever is going to be receiving your data. Can try to manage or at least reduce that problem by anonymizing data or pseudonymizing it. So removing directly identifiable information or even indirectly identifiable information, um, uh, applying uh, blurring or generalization techniques to make your data less sophisticated and it's to make sure that it's no longer possible to link the data to a specific individual. In that case, it's no longer personal data, but that's difficult to do effectively. It's, it's always risky because you need to be able to prove the effectiveness of your anonymization and pseudonymization techniques. It's not just sufficient that you've reduced the risk of, of identification. You really need to prove that the risk of identification um, is gone. And often that's not possible without um, uh, significantly reducing the value of your data or even removing all of the value from it. Um, it doesn't mean um, that data sharing is impossible for personal data. There are definitely cases where uh, personal data can be shared um, in a relatively open um, in a relatively open framework, but it does mean that you need to apply some minimal constraints. The whole approach of you know here it is, do what you want, that does not work with personal data. And this is also one of the topics where the new uh, data legislation um, tries to provide its own solutions. I, I mentioned here on this slide very briefly, the Data Governance Act, which actually creates a legal framework uh, for data sharing intermediaries who can help you to share personal data responsibly. Basically, it creates a specialized type of service provider. I'm not aware of any of those operating yet in, in the EU because it's still a relatively new framework. Uh, a specialized type of service provider that allows you to um, collect personal data and that allows people to manage um, data sharing access rights from that data holder to recipients to third parties. That's critical, for instance, also to enable uh, open science and, and for healthcare information um, and, um, uh, and make it a little bit easier to achieve the openness philosophy even when personal data is involved. So you have rules on that in the Data Governance Act and also in data altruism, the context where people um, altruistically choose to share their own personal information, including, for instance, medical records um, 
for purposes of public good, like scientific research, healthcare research. All of those are attempts to kind of um, bridge that gap between the, the whole philosophy and the, the, the desired goal of openness and the need to protect um, fundamental rights as well. So how do you manage that in practice? It really means that you need to look at both the upstream and the downstream side. First of all, the upstream side is for a data holder to collect their own rights to make sure that they have the necessary permissions to be able to share data openly. And the downstream side is actually regulating uh, your relationship towards the recipients. The upstream side um, usually is simpler. Uh, usually because there are obviously there are always the devils and in, in, in the details is about making sure well first of all whether any intellectual property rights or similar types of claims um, apply to your data and then making sure that you acquire the necessary claims so it's about usually getting uh, policies or contracts in place to transfer any intellectual property rights that might exist or to conclude contributor agreements with whoever is the source of um, of uh, of your data. Um, national legislation on that point helps a lot, certainly in the public sector, because in, in, in some countries, I'm a Belgian myself, so that's the context that I, I know um, the best. You have specific legislation, standardized agreements that require civil servants to transfer any intellectual property rights that they have automatically to the public administration that they work for. That actually, makes perfect sense because you know it's an example of what I mentioned earlier. It's a context where really intellectual property rights did not need to exist because your civil servants would have done their job even if they if they did not have any intellectual property rights, if they did not have any copyright claims to the works that they create. So national legislation there um, can act as an enabler in center, centralizing the rights. When that's not the case, when you don't have specific national legislation, you do have to have clear policies in place to govern um, who owns specific data uh, and assess at least on, on, on where the uh, where all of the rights are centralized. Once the rights are centralized, then you need to set up a downstream mechanism, which is typically setting up a mechanism of model licenses that allow you to share data in a harmonized, homogeneous way across a more or less broad range of potential reusers. So I mentioned model licenses like the Creative Commons family. I'll, I'll look a little bit later on at, at how that's done in practice. Um, but also uh, introducing any kind of additional uh, constraints. I, I call them acceptable use policies here um, to be able to handle reuses and to be able to handle abuses. Now, um, intuitively, if you read that critically, you can say that that doesn't logically work. You cannot have open data and acceptable use policies. Those two don't mesh. Either you create freedom and people can do what they want and that's open data or you add constraints, you build constraints on top of it, but then it's not open anymore. Um, that's a sort of fundamentalist perspective. It has some merit to it, but I think it's more useful in practice to look at it from a practical perspective, to see how far can you go. If you have the opportunity of really releasing data openly, for instance, using permissive licenses like the Creative Commons family, then that's uh, the best way to do it. But in some cases, it just isn't possible. There are potential risks and potential abuses that you need to mitigate and potential legal requirements that you have to handle as well, maybe. Like, for instance, when you're dealing with personal data, and in those cases, you need to basically dial down the, the openness to the point that you can make sure that you're handling data responsibly. So that's a balancing act. And that's the part that makes downstream um, rights management um, a lot more complicated. Even if there's a desire to just say, here it is, do what you want with it, which can be a very simple exercise. In practice, often you do need to apply some nuances. Now, um, uh, sort of as a closing part of this, this opening session, I want to look at um, two things very briefly, some practical examples of how to build openness. First of all, I want to look at the role of dynamic data sharing and, and APIs in enabling openness as a facilitator. And then also I want to look at some national approaches and look at how some member states are handling um, open uh, data sharing. Um, if I start first with the whole concept of, of open data and API based data sharing, um, why do we think that's interesting to begin with? Maybe that's a good point to start. Um, APIs are basically, in this context, a tool of integrating the X as a service paradigm into, um, into open data, into data management. Basically, get to go to a context where data is available as a service. Historically, you know, 10 years ago, data was mainly uh, available as, as, as static downloads. You know, there was uh, an Excel file or a CSV file that you could download, and uh, there was a license attached to it. Uh, and it worked for some use cases, but it didn't allow you to create a lot of value because you only got the information from that download. It wasn't dynamic. It wasn't guaranteed to be up to date. Um, 
obviously the market moved on. Everything is, is cloud based. Everything is as a service. Uh, dynamic data, data as a service uh, logically um, uh, followed that trend as well over the last 10 years. And the legislation has also followed to, um, to, 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 to keep track of that trend and to keep that into account. And you get legislation that more and more focuses not just on open data sharing, but on, on dynamic data sharing uh, through APIs. And you see that obviously in the, the last most recent recast of the PSI directive, the, the open data directive, which explicitly mandates the use of APIs for dynamic data sharing for high value data sets in particular. It's more generally encouraged, but specifically for high value data sets where really there is a significant potential to build um, societal and economic value on it. Uh, the data has to be made available via APIs. And to me, that sort of thing is fascinating because that's legislation actually not just mandating openness, but also sort of uh, pushing towards a certain data governance model, a business model even, to make sure that innovation can happen. And you see that in other contexts as well. I manage here the, the um, electricity legislation for intelligent metering systems, but also the automotive sector, which are both cases where um, data holders have to build open interfaces so that data can be read out dynamically. Um, there are bad examples for uh, from an, from of the openness perspective, by the way, because in the first case, the the um, there is a, a requirement for intermediaries to be to be in place for electricity data to make sure that not just anyone can get access to the data. And in the automotive um, industry, the focus is very much on allowing uh, independent uh, dealers and, and repair shops to get access to automotive data. So it's not data for everybody. It's not very open and unconstrained. So there are some constraints there, but the whole philosophy, the concept behind it, making data more open, not just from a technical perspective, but also from a regulatory and from a legal perspective, you do see that more and more often creeping its way into legislation. Also at the national level, by the way, there are some uh, member states and regions that have um, obligations to use APIs and dynamic data, data sharing systems uh, in their uh, legislation. APIs are pretty favorable from an openness perspective. Um, first of all, it's easier to establish dynamic ecosystems where data is exchanged between different kinds of stakeholders and where you get bilateral exchanges as well. Because one of the, the interesting um, aspects about the data economy is that it's not fairly clearly, clearly separate saying you're a data holder and you're a data recipient and you do not mix. Much more frequently data gets sh shared between this holder and that holder and this holder and that holder, and then there's an interme intermediary, and then there's another intermediary and a whole range of uh, uh, different users, including private consumers, companies, analytics uh, organizations. So you can get a whole um, complex ecosystem behind it. And dynamic data sharing via APIs is much more conducive, is much more capable of, of making that happen. It's also interesting because um, APIs from a legal perspective are often not cast as a licensing mechanism, but as a service mechanism. The same thing that you used to have with software. You used to buy software and you used to get a copy on discs or DVDs. Nowadays, you buy software as a service. It's a cloud paradigm. And it's the same thing in um, data sharing as a service. You buy a subscription to a service or you get a subscription to a service and it's dynamically available to you. So you don't necessarily need to work on the basis of licensing agreements. Doesn't mean that intellectual property rights uh, disappear, but you get more flexibility um, in, uh, in managing uh, rights grants and in managing um, usability and, and accessibility of data. Um, Again, intellectual property rights doesn't go don't go away. You still have to um, write your your subscription, your terms and conditions to include intellectual property rights provisions. But it does uh, make it a little bit easier there uh, to manage those intellectual property rights and to create a coherent package, for instance, that also includes um, fundamental rights protection and data protection. Um, so yeah, I think uh, APIs there are an interesting way to build um, uh, open data sharing. I promised you also that I would take a look at some national licensing approaches. So what do member states actually do when they want to share data openly? I did some homework in the course of last week, and I was actually a little bit surprised. I think some of you might know this already, but I think for many of you, this will come as a surprise at how coherent the picture is. So I looked at some member states that I knew and member states that I didn't know about, uh, how they handled uh, data licensing, including somewhere I knew that they had uh, their own national uh, data sharing licenses. I actually was a little bit surprised to, to, to learn from my homework. When I looked at, I mentioned just a couple of examples here of, of uh, member states that have uh, open data sharing portals. Basically, you only see 
and that was to me surprising. You only see two big flavors of uh, open data sharing systems left at the national level and the, the bigger regional level. You have portals that basically say, you know, um, our data publishers, whoever the, publishes the data, they add their own licensing mechanism, so we don't intervene. We we don't know. We don't have a standardized policy. That's one group, and it's an increasingly small group of member states. But every other member state, and that's the one that I mentioned on the slide here, every other member state that actively endorses a specific open data license includes Creative Commons licenses. That was very surprising to me because that's a trend that only, well, obviously that's started more than a decade ago, but that seems to have really accelerated in the last couple of years, the reliance on Creative Commons licensing um, at national portal level as well. And even in cases where it's not constrained, where you don't have to necessarily use Creative Commons licenses, you see that a lot of data sets are made available under Creative Commons licenses. So I mentioned here uh, at the, 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 the examples from Belgium, where there is uh, encouragement to use a CC0 declaration. So basically that's a declaration saying, I will not enforce my intellectual property rights. I dedicate it to the public domain. It's not exactly the same, but largely works out that way. Um, and alternatively, uh, promoting also uh, CC BY licenses, which is the one where you can basically do what you want, but you have to uh, uh, contain, you have to maintain the attributions, you have to link to the source, you have to acknowledge where you got the data from. Uh, that doesn't mean that the, the, the bespoke licenses, the ones that are nationally designed and the nationally maintained, have disappeared completely. Um, uh, Belgium, both at the federal level and at, at some of the regional levels, have their own bespoke licenses for commercial and non-commercial use, which are a little bit more tailored to the local um, the local context. Same thing also I mentioned the Italian open license in, in Italy. I haven't mentioned it on the slide, but I think France has an, 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 an own national license as well. Those are all those still exist. But to me, the interesting part was that that common trend of relying on um, uh, standardized open licenses as a way to make data more easily available. There is also, and that's a second trend that's worth signaling, a very big reluctance to um, include personal data on these portals simply because of the complexity of, of mixing uh, Creative Commons licensing with personal data protections. That's a hard sell on the one hand to say we are open, we are making it available to do what you want with it, and at the same time uh, making sure that you handle fundamental rights protections and personal data protections um, responsibly. So um, that's really it. That's what was, was the main trends that I wanted to highlight uh, as a part of this uh, of this introduction on what sort of the, the main legal constraints are um, and where um, uh, yeah, some of the main licensing approaches come in and, and, and what some of the main tools are. Um, I see that there are a couple of questions already. We have uh, sort of a Q&A scheduled at the end, so I will deal with those, but that will be um, at the end of the session. First, maybe I will pass the floor to uh, my colleague Jean Potriai, who will tell us a little bit more about the, the EU perspective. Thank you, Hans. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks to the organizers for having invited me to present indeed what we, we do in the Commission and in the EU institutions um, in this area of legal openness and, uh, uh, as uh, Hans was saying, uh, open everything. Let's see maybe together how this is being implemented in the Commission. Tell me if you see my slides. Yes, we can see them. Very good, OK. So f first a word to say, <clears throat> I come from the, uh, uh, as was mentioned, I, I work in the Commission Central IP Service. What do we do there? Where well, we are a team of IP lawyers um, advising uh, the Commission, but also occasionally other institu EU institutions and, and EU agencies are on IP issues they may encounter in their daily work. We don't do legislation or, 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 or IP policy for, for, the, for the union itself, but for the Commission as an administration. So one of our tasks and our daily work is to ensure that indeed the Commission, and for that matter, when, when other institutions ask us, the other institutions, how do you then implement in your work um, as an administration the principles of um, legal openness? And of course, in that, in that field, we do work a lot with the Office of Publications, uh, which does a lot of work in that area, obviously. Um, what am I going to present to you today, briefly? Um, I will focus on the European Commission, um, first because it is the biggest 
producer, if we can say producer, of, of, of documents and data, but it's also, I would say, the most advanced when it when it we talk about legal openness, and I'll explain you why uh, and how. Um, and I'll be dealing with not not open everything, but at least I'll focus on documents, data, software, and scientific uh, articles. And then we'll have a quick look at um, some examples from other EU institutions than um, the Commission. OK, how does it work when we talk about copyright and EU documents? Well, first, maybe a reminder. There is a, a I, would, I would say, a, a general understanding or acceptance that there is no copyright on official documents such as EU directives, so legislation, EU directives or EU regulations on decisions by the Court of Justice. You will not see a copyright notice or a, an open license or, or, or on court decisions from the ECG. Also, no copyright on um, the, the speeches or discussions that are um, taking place in the Parliament. So this is completely freely reusable by publishers and other users outside, completely outside of copyright. In a way, I guess you could say in the public domain. When it comes to all the other documents, reports, data sets produced as a result of the work of the Commission, software developed in the Commission, all, all other documents, well, there indeed, that can be provided the legal conditions of originality is met. There can be, of course, a copyright on these elements or a database right, if we talk about uh, databases, which will then belong, legally speaking, to the EU. So not, not so much as the commission to the commission, but to the EU, which is the only uh, legal entity for all the EU institutions. But under this umbrella of one legal entity, as we'll see, there are some various practices and, uh, and ways of working um, in addition to what we uh, to the EU institutions then we also have uh, all, all the EU agencies many of them having their or, or maybe all of them actually having their own legal separate personality and to a certain extent their own policy when it comes to um, exercise of copyright and legal openness. Let's now go through the different assets I, I, I mentioned and start with documents. So documents produced by the Commission are fully reusable. We have in the Commission adopted the so-called reuse decision, so the decision of the Commission on the reuse of Commission documents, um, which basically implements in the Commission or applies to the Commission the principles of the PSI Directive, PSI and Open Data um, Directive, we voluntarily decide to adhere by the principles of these uh, of these texts, even though they may not directly apply to us. But very much so, the reuse decision is a, an implementation to the Commission of the PSI Directive. Uh, it just applies to all documents that have been published or were not published, but for that matter, could have been published. Um, studies, reports, impact assessments, etc., etc. Let's distinguish this, so the documents that have been published, from um, documents that um, have not been published and to which, of course, other rules can apply, such as the rules on access to document freedom of information um, rules, uh, as we sometimes call them. And in the Commission and the EU institutions, we have the famous regulation 1049 2001 on access to documents for access to documents that have not been published and are not of such a nature that they should normally be published. Okay, so much for documents. So, and I'll come back to it later, but documents um, fully reusable. What is reuse? I won't, I won't go into detail here, just to say that the way we understand reuse, well, it is the same, and the text here show that uh, we've copy-pasted the, the definition of reuse that comes from the uh, PSI directive. What does it, what does the reuse decision apply to? Well, all documents defined as any content, whatever the medium, paper or electronic, text, sound images, or any part of such document, and I'll say in a minute that that also applies to data and data sets. So that's what is in the scope, what is not in scope of the reuse decision. So what does not fall under the idea of full reusability? Well, obviously, and as in the PSI directive, documents covered by IP rights of third parties. You can only allow the reuse on things that 
you have the IP ownership of or on elements that already were made available by a third party as an open um, open source software or an open um, document or open uh, data set. Sorry. Um, we also have a lot, a number of these exceptions that are coming also from the PSI, security, defense, privacy, trade secrets, all of that. Uh, if there's no uh, access to document that is allowed, these will be excluded. These are also um, coming from the, and have this list of exceptions has also been introduced in the PSI directive, and I guess you will also know that. Um, but so much so for, for, for documents, so fully reusable. Then what about data? Well, there also, open data is the principle. The reuse decision applies to data and data sets. So all data produced by the Commission as a result of its work should fall under the reuse principles. What about research data, a specific category of uh, data, and in particular, data coming from the research work of the Joint Research Centre of the Commission. We in the Central IP Service, we are part of the Joint Research Centre of the Commission, which is a, a director general uh, where you have researchers actually doing research to advise uh, the, commission, the Commission on a number of topics. They, these researchers are producing a lot of data what applies to this data? You might remember the initial PSI directive did not include research data in its scope. As a consequence of that, our initial reuse decision was also excluding research data from the scope, but then it was decided in the Commission already back in 2011 to include explicitly research data from the Joint Research Centre. So research data from the work of the Commission in the, in the research field was already included in the reuse decision back in 2011. So even before the PSI directive itself did also include this in its own scope. So in a way on this, we were in the Commission in advance uh, compared to the uh, legislator. It's good to say data can be reused, but how do you implement that in practice? It's, it's one, one thing to say it, another one to implement it. In the JRC, so in the Joint Research Center, we have an articulate data policy. You'll find it, uh, if you're interested, you can find the text that is public um, with, uh, via the link here, which endorses the principles of free, full, open and timely access, also in accordance with the FAIR principle that many of you will know, freely accessible, identifiable, retrievable data. In addition to a data policy, we of course have also our open data portal that will then feed into the EU open data portal. We wanted to really help researchers to implement these, these principles. Therefore, we have developed also a an online tool really helping via decision trees and, and, and all sorts of mechanisms helping researchers to <clears throat> actually go all the way to the <clears throat> publication of their data set, <clears throat> sorry, and guiding them also up to the drafting of the appropriate copyright notice. So we really, I think, have gone all, have tried to go all the, as, as far as possible to come to actual implementation of these principles, also giving training to researchers, and I was giving one <clears throat> not later than uh, yesterday morning to to, uh, to to the GRC researchers. Mm -hmm. But then you could say, which license do you use? What, uh, under which conditions do you allow the reuse of, <clears throat> of all these documents and data? Until 2019, we had a special copyright notice for, com for the Commission, which was basically saying reuse is authorized along the lines of the reuse decision. In a way, we were telling reuse, you know, figure out what it means, go and read the text. That was not machine readable, that was not a standard license, so certainly not ideal, and we know the discussions about <coughs> um, the, the problems that may come from the fact that many um, institutions will, rather than use a standard license, think it is better to have your own specific open license. Um, we thought it was not a good idea in 2019. I, maybe it's worth mentioning that we in the Central IP Service wrote a study where we compared the respective benefits of having your own copyright notice, even if it is a, also implementing an open 
an open policy, um, the respective advantages or disadvantages of having your own specific notice versus going for a standard existing license. <clears throat> that um, study we <coughs> made, sorry, is also publicly available, talking about openness. Um, so we compared a number of, of uh, open licenses and we came to the conclusion that the best way to ensure in practice legal openness was to adopt Creative Commons CC BY, plus also in some cases CC uh, zero. And a decision was thus taken in 2019 to adopt CC BY as the default solution and the default licenses that should be used for all commission documents and data <coughs> uh, sets. So this is when we, talking about this trend um, that uh, Hans referred to, this is when we as commission also decided to follow this idea of using Creative Commons as the standard uh, license. There had been resistance up to then, but we were eventually able to convince the commission services to go for that. I don't think I need to talk about Creative Commons, but <clears throat> because I'm sure most of you know it, but um, we know the, the, as I mentioned, the difficulty that may come from the fact that some institutions decide to keep their own specific licenses forcing users to check them, um, not allowing search engines to recognize metadata in the documents, um, and therefore not able, not, not allowing research engines to identify these documents or data as really open. Um, Creative Commons is meant as, as a solution to that uh, problem, and I don't think I need to also go into the details here, but what we have adopted is this, the most permissive one, CC uh, by, uh, therefore, meaning you can basically do what you want with the data or the document, provided you acknowledge the source. So you attribute the source back to the um, initial authors and the initial owners. I don't think I need to go through this here because I want to leave the leave time for, for questions, obviously. Um, there again, um, our idea was it's good to take decisions um, as, as a matter of principle, but let's go one step further. We also then in, in the central IP service drafted detailed guidelines on how you then implement this when you want to publish your documents. Which copyright notice do you have to use to affix to all your documents and data sets? We therefore drafted this document, which is available to at least within the commission for, for, for commission um, staff. And we do regularly give trainings to staff on this. Um, just to illustrate this, this was the use, the, the uh, copyright notice up to then. Uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, no, this, this is, sorry, now the current and the actual standard copyright notice referring, as you see, to Creative Commons 4.0. Um, so, so much for documents and data. What about software? Quickly a word. We have a commission strategy that was adopted 2020, uh, that was renewed in 2020, Think called Think Open, encouraging the use of open source and encouraging also the open source licensing of EC on, com on software. Whenever we develop software, the idea, even though the PSI directive does not make that obligatory, we have decided Last year, in December 2021, we in the Commission, in the Central IP Service, pushed for and obtained that the Commission decide that from now on, by default, all software developed by the Commission should, should be made um, available as open source. That decision is sort of the equivalent of the reuse decision for software, published in the official journal you will easily find if you are interested. Um, there also we want we wanted to um, go for well i'll say there the the idea is open source um preferably using the eu public license standard license uh, or open source licensing but not obligate not not necessarily if there are other reasons to use another open source license that is also possible again because it's good to have decisions but implementation is is the key word we have a, a GitHub repository, of course, also to host all these open source software. We have trainings that we give, and we have also detailed guidelines for EC services and developers that were just 
finalized a few um, months ago, implementing that decision. Coming to the end, scientific articles, um, open access there. So same as for, in a way, data, documents, software. For scientific articles coming from the work of the scientists, in particular of the Joint Research Center, open access is the um, principle, gold open access as the principle, um, applied in the very large majority of cases, sometimes green open access, X in very rare cases, some exclusive rights for limited periods to publishers, but the, the principle is also open access guidelines developed by us also available for researchers trainings that we give. So again, also an emphasis, I would say, on implementation of the principles. Um, one word to say maybe that it's important. I mean, you, of course, you can only decide that the data, the documents, the um, the, the, pro, the software will be made available as open um, as an open asset uh, if you own the IP on these assets in the first place. It is true um, for all uh, uh, for all elements developed by EU staff, Article 18 of the staff regulations provide that IP um, intellectual property on anything that is created by EU staff will belong to the EU. And in all our procurement contracts with third parties, well, by default, the templates of our contracts provide that whatever is created specifically for the uh, Commission will belong. I mean, the, on, the IP ownership of these new results will belong to the EU, uh, in our case, to the Commission, which will then allow us, if we wish, to make that available as open under an open license. So in a way, as a conclusion for the Commission, I think we can say um, safely that the Commission walks the talk, document reusable, open data, open source, open access. We have rules, we have strategies, policies per type of asset, an open a standard open license adopted as CC BY, our, uh, our so open license for software, practical guidelines, tools, trainings, our service where I, I said our work, where as I said, part of our work is really to enfo to make sure that these principles are, are fully um, followed. And as I said, sometimes we are even a bit ahead of time. Um, I mentioned research, I mentioned open source, where it's not compulsory, but we did decide to go for, for open source. How are other institutions uh, following? Well, they certainly are encouraged to, to follow. Many of them are looking at what the Commission does and tend to follow or try to, to follow. Discussions have taken place a while ago to try to adopt a common approach and CC by by default, these discussions are not finalized, but I keep my fingers crossed and have not given hope that we could convince the other EU institutions to indeed also go for creative commons for their data and documents. EU agencies, separate legal entities in most cases, well, sometimes will have their own explicit own policy on reuse. More often will take inspiration from the, what the Commission does, I would say. So the other institutions um, try to um, follow the Commission, but to their credit, uh, even if if they don't uh, f fully follow all the time, uh, one could say that that's because they try to follow, but we maybe we're running fast. Um, a, a few examples of how, how that works. Um, the Council has, it, has adopted its own open data policy on the reuse of uh, Council documents. Now, on the other hand, when you look at their website, what it says is, and I've copied it here, reproduction is authorized, provided the Council of the EU is always acknowledged. So reproduction is authorized, but that doesn't say reuse, which I would say is a bit suboptimal. If we talk, the, if we um, look at the Parliament, the Parliament I know is working and thinking about how to improve their own reuse uh, policy. For the moment, their copyright notice on their website is maybe not also completely uh, optimal in the sense that it says that the, as a general rule, the reuse is authorized. So that's good for commercial, for personal or for further commercial or non-commercial dissemination. Good. But then it says, provided that the entire item is reproduced. Well, this is not fully in line, I would say, with reuse. But I know the Parliament is doing its own homework on these things um, for the moment. Um, and I'll finish with one example. This is not a competition where one agency has you know, been awarded the, the, the prize of the best one. But I would say, if you take one example, for instance, there are many EU agencies, but this one um, called CEDEFOP has a copyright notice on all their reports, which fully endorses and follows Creative Commons um, CC BY 4.0. So an example there of a full implementation of 
of an open document and open data policies. And with this, I would like to uh, finish and give the floor back to you. Any question will be addressed afterwards. And I, just to show that we we walk the talk, this presentation is available under a CC BY 4.0 license, and I've transferred all my rights to the EU as a consequence of Article 18 of the staff regulation. Back to you. Thank you very much, Jean Paul, for uh, for this super informative and also encouraging uh, presentation. Trying to move everybody <laughs> to uh, uh, Creative Commons or other open license. So we're going to move now to the Q and A and feedback. In this part, we're not only going to address some of the questions here, but uh, in the in the chat. But uh, we also would like to hear from you uh, because here we have many uh, data providers coming from national, uh, local, and also supranational from other institution, EU institutions. So we would like to hear from you what are your practices, what you are doing from your side, uh, what is the actual um, a strategy that you're following on this direction. So please feel free to, to share in the chat and then we can have like a larger discussion. In the meantime, um, I'm going to uh, pass a couple of questions to um, to Hans. Uh, so Hans, we have one question regarding uh, the like the term and difference between intellectual property and copyright. So uh, Maria Postolo asked uh, if it would be right that we mentioned that data and data visualization may be protected by intellectual property rights. Or should we use data um, that and data visualizations may be protected by uh, copyright? Both of those are technically right because all you're saying is that they may apply, which is always true, obviously. If you say that they may apply, it also means that they may not apply. Um, but joking aside, I think in this particular context, I might in, might suggest if you want to say I want to be as accurate as possible, I would refer to intellectual property rights because it would, it would include both copyrights and database rights. Database rights, um, so databases can be protected by uh, by copyrights if they're actually a creative original work, but next to that we have the separate database rights in the European Union, which also can apply for non-creative works that require a significant investment. So uh, intellectual property rights is a lot more inclusive it's also a lot more vague because you will get into inevitable discussions about things like whether you know trade secrets uh, cover fall under intellectual property rights as well. Um, but I think that the intellectual property rights phrasing is a little bit more inclusive and a little bit more generic. So if you want to say I want I just want to have a general statement and I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything, I would go for intellectual property rights uh, in, in, in that particular case. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much for your reply. We also have another question regarding data protection because uh, according to our experience with data providers is one of the main constraints that mm -hmm. they find in when we have to fight uh, for, for legal openness. So this question is from Bernard uh, Kravina. So he asked about uh, what happens when you give legal, uh, when you give, when there are private person who gives consent on, uh, on sharing their data. Is this personal consent sufficient for accountability? What, what do you think about this? So I am very happy to get that question because I have now have to disclose a secret that some people might know already. In addition to being a lawyer, I'm also, as a hobby, I'm also the president of a regional data protection authority. So I have to advise on uh, the legality of data protection uh, legislation in uh, the Flanders uh, region, not just only for, for e-government stuff. So that's uh, probably the smallest data protection authority in Europe, but technically it is one. Um, and we actually encountered that question recently in the context specifically of, of legislation that would require the publication, uh, name, affiliation, and contact uh, contact address of researchers who receive the public grant. Um, and that we advised negatively there as a data protection authority for the simple reason being that we did not see the justification. We didn't see why it would be proportionate to put in specific to publish a specific person's name, contact information, and affiliation. I do understand that it's necessary for people to keep track of who is receiving public funding and to see, for instance, whether it's realistic. You know, if somebody says uh, I'm receiving fun funding to do full five full time jobs, clearly something weird is going on there. So uh, collecting the data as such is, is not wrong. Publishing information as such is also not wrong, but it should be limited in scope and there should be a clear legal basis for it. So to say, you know, this person, 
working at this institution uh, is taking the lead for a research project seems more easily justifiable than, for instance, to say, here is a complete list of all the people who are involved or who claim to be involved in this project and their contract information. You need a justification for that. So um, that requires a look at the legislation. So basically two things. If you're a legislator and you want to introduce rules like that, I personally, as a data protection authority, so switching my caps for a moment, I need a good justification about why you think that that's reasonable and proportionate, because I'm skeptical that that's justifiable. You need to tell, be able to explain why that's a good idea and what, what good thing you're hoping to achieve by making that information publicly available. So that's if you're a legislator. Here, um, I don't know if the question is from a legislator here. It might be more be the, the opposite thing and say, look, we didn't make the rules. We're just trying to follow them or we're trying to create a framework. The thing that makes this question a little bit trickier is that you say, well, private persons have agreed to be listed as grant receivers, so is consent sufficient for accountability? I don't think so, because I don't think that this is a context where you can rely on the consent of the people involved, because a lot of those people, this, this might be boring for a lot of the audience, so I do apologize for that, but uh, most of the people who get these grants do that as a part of their job. Um, if you look at your personal situation, if your uh, employer asks you to do something or you need to do something in order to be able to do your job accurately, you don't have the realistic possibility to say no. Maybe theoretically you have the possibility to say no and say, well, no, never mind about this grant. I'm sure some other source of funding will come up. But for most people, they're not in a luxury situation like that. So this isn't a case where the consent as a legal basis, in my view, I, the devil, I'm sure the devil is in the details, but I would say that this is a case where you cannot work on the basis of consent because the people involved, the researchers involved, don't have the realistic possibility of saying no. That doesn't mean you cannot do it, and it doesn't mean that you can't ask for their permission as sort of an ethical safeguard to say, I just, I want you to say yes because I just want to know whether you're okay with this, but I would never, never rely in this context based on what I'm just seeing in the short chat question, on their consent as a legal basis. You can't say mm -hmm. it's necessary for me to publish your information. For instance, in the, in the example that I mentioned earlier, there's legislation saying I have to do it, or um, I, there, in, in your case, maybe there is no legislation, but you just say as a matter of policy, I think it's necessary and beneficial to do it. But then you need to be able to justify exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, and I'm not saying there is no way to do this, but it has to be fairly minimal and you'd have to have a good justification behind it. Friends, I would think a good balance might be I will publish the name and the, the uh, affiliation like the university that they're working for, or the company that they're working on of the person who's leading that research. That seems easily justifiable, but not everybody who's working on it, not the exact amount that, that they got, not contact information, because all of that leaks more information than, than it needs to have. There's a ton more to say about this, but I don't want to uh, monopolize the entire uh, the entire discussion. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much, Hans. Actually, this is something that uh, that maybe should be because when you are talking about this, if, for me, it looks like a whole process until you choose uh, the the like the right license in which you want to share your data. So. Uh, um, for me, uh, this part would be like more in the preliminary steps in the part of the data processing, data cleaning. So. Here, that's why like, I have the feeling that uh, legal experts should be uh, part of the whole process of data management and data cleaning before even uh, choosing the licensing uh, to really understand to which level they can actually share or not share the data and according to that, choosing the right license to that. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. okay. Um, we also have a, one question from uh, from Lucas regarding high value data set. A high value data set. So this is a bit out of the scope of this specific uh, webinar. So we're going to uh, answer you separately you separately about this. Um, because we're just very quickly, I, I cheated and looked it up. And if nothing has been changed in the draft, it enters into application six months after it is published. But I think the question is mm -hmm. more, OK, when is it being published? That I don't know, and I doubt that anybody else in, in, the, in the, the session knows. But if someone knows or knows if the six month deadline has changed, feel free to post it in the chat, but that should be an answer. Mm -hmm. Good, perfect. And then uh, uh, we have a question also for for you, Jean Paul. Uh, it comes from Tim. Um, so, what if the Commission publishes data that it received that was has been produced by a third party and also includes a uh, personal uh, information in data on, on metadata? For example, your Commission receives uh, responses uh, to public consultations written by others uh, on have your say. Can I just reuse this personal information? What do you think, uh, Jean-Paul? What's your 
take. Yes, I'm a bit hesitant to 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 answer on that one for, mm -hmm. for the reason that in the Commission we have data protection um, correspondence in each DG, and they are in charge of, of you know explaining the policy and giving all the guidelines and answering that type of question. I would not want to do this. I know they are. <clears throat> I mean, we have a lot of policies, guidelines, and rules in place to ensure that the uh, the data protection rules are. Um, you know, respected, um, even when that means a lot of uh, additional burden on the services, uh, as we all know. But that's all, all I could say on this. Sorry, uh, maybe uh, maybe Hans would want to, to, to answer. I mean, uh, generally speaking, on, on the question, but I would not want to, you know, be be, uh, be explaining because that's not really our, our role, and I would not want to step on the foot uh, feet of, of the data protection coordinators in the commission on this. Mm -hmm. it, it is very context specific and it, it depends. Yeah, I This is the typical lawyer's answer, meaning it's probably not very useful for you, but um, it, it, this is one of those cases where you do need to look at the, the, the legal framework as well to see what, what specific kind of mm -hmm. use of the information has been, been authorized. Yeah. And then you need to do an assessment of what else is, is justified. So. I, I I love looking into these things as a general principle, um, but I think indeed I, I wouldn't be able to answer it right now without looking more at the at the details. So I have to stick with the lawyer's answer. It depends. So um, yes, I have the feeling that it also depends on the case by case basis, and we will need like to know actually the the specifications of the of this case. So we don't have like a general, a general mm -hmm. uh, reply that we can use in uh, every time. Mm -hmm. um, we also have uh, a concrete question regarding the Digital Markets Act from Martina from RTD. Uh, she's uh, mentioning that uh, yes, it's rule to regulate gatekeepers, and these gatekeepers uh, must grant their businesses uh, users uh, to access the data. How will help uh, use business? They use business to compete with the giants, with the big tech giants. So uh, I'll, I'll provide initial answer, and John Paul can be can feel free to, uh, to to add to that. So um, to me, this is a, a, a one of the very interesting ones because I, I think I have to be honest about it and say the way the Digital Markets Act is set up is kind of an experiment um, because it creates specific rules for the gatekeepers, so for the very big organizations that have a fundamental impact on competitiveness in the market. So the you know, list is still to be finalized, but obviously you know, the legislators are thinking of the Microsoft and the Apples and the Facebooks and the Googles, you know, the ones that have massive amounts of, of <clears> data. And what's happening here to me is very intriguing because there's a default set of, of legal rules that are being introduced specifically for those category of designated gatekeepers. Um, meaning that the information that they hold has to be more easily shareable, including with competitors, to reduce lock-in effects, because it is true and it is normal. Um, IT companies are very good at building a service portfolio across you know, their central package. If, if you do everything in the Microsoft world, or in the Apple world, or in the Amazon world, although if you stick within that one, uh, within that one context, within that well, on one technology stack, everything is a lot easier and there are competing services out there, but it requires data to be moved outside of that stack and it's harder, sometimes impossible, sometimes harder. And what the EU wants to do here is basically create an enforceable right, specifically for those gatekeepers, not in general, but an enforceable right to make it to make it possible and make it easier even to get your data out of that technology stack and to put it with others. That should be and that's the theory, and I hope also the practice, but time will tell. In theory, that'll help European businesses a lot better because right now they can mm -hmm. still face that challenge where they say, I have something that plays fantastically with Amazon, with Microsoft, with mm -hmm. one of the gatekeepers, but I need them to cooperate. And there is actually no incentive for those gatekeepers uh, to cooperate with me because mm -hmm. they have their own competing service which I think, because I'm the European innovator, I think mine is much better. But obviously, if they open up their data, then all of a sudden they're facing competition and they don't want competition. So they're not going to do it. They're not going to open up. And therefore, I can't sell my products. I can, you know, I have something that does, I don't know, uh, analysis of how hosting services works, but it needs to, I can work with the European SMEs that agree to work with me, but I can't work with Amazon. Okay, then that's 70% of your market potential gone. So the whole concept of the Digital Markets Act is 
not openness in the sense of all data is open for everybody, but it's openness in the sense of data portability, things that I was talking about in the discussion of basically the recognition that mm -hmm. if I'm working with a gatekeeper, it's still my data, even though a gatekeeper is, is holding it, and I should be able to determine when the gate opens and who gets access to it. And that should allow European innovators to create more, to sell more um, innovative services and to build their own markets. That's the, the concept and the philosophy. Uh, theoretically, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think it's 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 a good move. But yeah, devil in the details. We'll have to see how it works out in the end. Yes, let's see what's going to happen in the next uh, five years. Actually, just connected to this because uh, anti-competitive uh, un uh, competition and uh, digital digital markets seems like a, to be like a very hot topic. And I would like to take the opportunity also to uh, tell you that we're going to have one specific report about this that was produced actually by our expert Hans uh, Groff from Timelex. Uh, so it's Sorry. going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, so you'll have to listen to me some more. Yes, yeah, so we're advancing already some information. So we're going to publish actually one report on this specific topic. So I would invite you to to go through the website or that Dr. Pata to you. We'll publish it in the coming two weeks. Uh, so you will be able to 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 see the first discussion on this matter. Um, I also have one last question before we move to the feedback form and future webinars. So is from Evi, uh, is, uh, are these different rules for research data sets uh, that result from public funding? I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it, maybe, and then, mm -hmm. then Jean-Paul can, oh. uh, can complement it. Um, so, the general principle, increasingly, and this is also true at the national level, it's true at the EU level, but also at the national level, is if you want to have funding, if you want to receive public sector funding, your information has to be made available uh, under uh, open access. I'll, I think. Jean-Paul knows the mechanism of sort of the, 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 the gold access and green access stuff probably a little bit better than I do. But increasingly, the principle is if you want to get taxpayer money to do your work, you have to build openness into it. You can't use public funding to create purely private benefits. Um, this is the transversal rule. There are always exceptions and there need to be. Like We are involved uh, historically in a lot of healthcare research projects. There, obviously, you can't get in a situation where you use public funding to collect patient records, do medical analysis, and then make that openly available. So there are always exceptions. That's about personal data, about privacy and patient information. There are comparable ones where there are constraints to it. But at least the fundamental principle is, indeed, if you receive public funding, you have to assess whether it's legally possible to make that information publicly available, and if so, then you must do it. And I think the mere fact that you have to have for pretty much any uh, publicly funded project a data management plan that describes how you are going to make that data available and to what extent and under which conditions uh, helps a lot to make companies think about that. I think we're getting to a point where historically that was an annoying burden that you had, so you had to, you know, cobble together a data management plan that nobody actually cared too much about. But because that's done so systematically now, people take it a lot more seriously and are a lot more, the maturity is a lot bigger and, and making sure that that information gets managed and that's unlockable also for peer review purposes. So I think that that's a very positive trend. Maybe just one thing to add, under EU research programs, uh, you also have the principle that, that in addition to, to what Hans has explained, at the same time, the principle is as open as, uh, as possible, but as close as necessary, in the sense that if um, disclosing the data, especially disclosing the data or the information in a scientific journal too early uh, would um, prejudice the possibility to go for a patent application, for instance, because you've disclosed the information and this, it's no longer novel in the patent sense of the word. Um, that is not compulsory then. Of course, the, the purpose of these EU research programs and, and grants is to help the development of new services and new products that will come on the market and, and benefit consumers and, and companies and societies in general. So, so the openness principle is one thing, but it does not come at the price of jeopardizing, of course, the possibility to to do indeed obtain IP protection, such as a patent on, on the result of that uh, research program. Mm -hmm. uh, just to very briefly complement that, because that is an important part that I overlooked. 
So in the op Open Data Directive, you do have an obligation for member states to have national policies or relevant legislation. They can choose whether it needs formal legislation or policies to make publicly funded research openly available with open access policies and in compliance with fair principles. So mm -hmm. it's not just something that is pushed when you're applying as a precondition for applying for grants, but member states are actually legally required to have policies uh, specifically for publicly funded research. Um, so legislation and national policy should be uh, should be aligned to that now. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for these interventions. Also to Hans and Jean Paul for your uh, presentations for for the presentation on these uh, best practices. Also like all the is different scopes that we have. So thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, moving uh, forward, uh, we're going to have more webinars uh, in the future. So then next web ah, OK, so first, of sorry. Uh, so we will be very grateful if you can provide us your feedback. It was going to take a couple of minutes so you can scan the code and you will all not only rate this specific webinar, but you will also help us to improve in the future. So there are specific questions about uh, what are the webinars that you would like to see in the academy in the future, because we would like to shape the, the this learning material according to your needs. So please take a few minutes and we will take this into account. And then uh, don't miss our next webinar on geospatial harvesting uh, on data.zorba.to. You can always uh, register via data.zorba.to. Um, so, Julia, I would recommend that we leave the first slide before, like the, 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 the previous slide before, so they can provide feedback. And with this, I would like to thank you all so much for your time. Uh, I hope you found this uh, webinar interesting. Um, and let's try to uh, make open data uh, a philosophy.